is our last time to study from Exodus for quite some time. It is the case that we've been studying from Exodus because lads to leaders have Exodus as their Bible Bowl material, and they've been studying Exodus in their classes. But next week, we will be having the area-wide uh, youth devotional next Sunday evening. And by the way, that is a great opportunity, wonderful singing, a very good message preached from a, a guest speaker. And then the next week, and they will be going to Lads to Leaders. And so that kind of finishes up the Exodus portion. And actually, as I began to think in terms of studying from Exodus, didn't necessarily think in terms of, in detail, of all of when you get past, you might say, the Sinai stuff with regards to the tabernacle, the furniture, and et cetera, which comprises quite a bit of the latter part of the book of Exodus. Didn't really think in terms of going in that detail. What I want us to look at today, though, is kind of a little bit of review, and then looking at chapter 15. Now, Exodus, somebody might think, okay, Exodus, Exodus. Okay, that's about the Israelites when they left Egypt. Somebody else says, wait, wait, Exodus, Exodus. That's about Pharaoh and the Egyptians and what they did to the Israelites. And somebody else might say, Exodus, Exodus. Oh, plagues. That's where you read about the ten plagues. And as concerns all of these answers, that's what you find in chapters 1 through 13. But I would suggest to you that the book of Exodus and these chapters are really about something else. Now, as you get to chapter 1, get down into verse 13, you read that the Egyptians had ruthlessly made the people of Israel work as slaves and made their lives bitter with hard service. And then again, at the last part of that, they ruthlessly made them work as slaves. Gone were the days of Joseph and his brothers and, and treated in a fine fashion in Egypt. Gone were those days. Now they're mistreated, treated as slaves. But the numbers of the Israelites kept multiplying. And so the Egyptians are thinking, hey, maybe there's too many. In fact, with as many men as there are, were we to be invaded? It could be that there would be an army rise up against us within our own land. So let's do this. Midwives, when a Hebrew child is born, kill them. Well, thankfully, those Hebrew uh, midwives did not do that. And then as you get down to the end of chapter 1, then it's kind of like, okay, let's uh, try something else. Cast them into the Nile River. Well, then we come to Moses being born. And oh, Moses is, well, not exactly cast. I think more carefully placed in a little, you might even say a little boat prepared for him to keep him safe, placed among the reeds in the Nile. No, he didn't just float away. And then Pharaoh's daughter found him. It seems to be this was the plan. And then, of course, Moses' sister comes. and Don't you need help taking care of him? And then Moses' own mother hired to help take care of Moses when he's at little baby and little boy. Well, then Moses grows up. Now, in the meantime of growing up, he's growing up in Pharaoh's household. In other words, he's learning the workings of Egypt and Pharaoh, and he's learning in all the ways of the Egyptians. He's getting a good education. Might say the best education money could buy in Egypt. But he's also learned of who he is. And you think he could have only learned this from his mother. And so one day he comes out and he sees an Egyptian taskmaster mistreating his fellow Hebrews and he kills that taskmaster. And then he goes out and finds 
some of his own Hebrew brethren kind of quarreling amongst themselves. He says something, but their response is, you're going to do to us like you did to that taskmaster? And he knows words out. And so he flees. That's the first 40 years of his life. And over the next 40 years, he's in Midian and he's working as a shepherd. Then the burning bush. He sees that bush burning and it's not consumed. And it's God speaking to him out of that bush and letting him know that he is the one chosen to lead the Israelites out of Egypt now. It's very obvious Moses is not so keen on hearing that. And he makes excuses. In fact, it's one excuse after another until he really makes the Lord pretty weary of hearing these excuses. And so now, Moses goes back to Egypt. Now at the very first, of course, there's his encounter with the Hebrews, and then, and then with Pharaoh. And uh, that's when you read about the rod or the staff turning into the snakes. See, his snake, but then the magicians, they're able to turn their staff into snakes, and then Moses' snake eats the others, overpowers them. But Pharaoh is persistently hardening his heart and will not let the Israelites leave. And then we begin to read about the plagues. Ten plagues. Like I say, sometimes when people think about Exodus, that's what they're thinking about, the ten plagues. Well, the first one you read of in chapter 8, excuse me, chapter 7, verse 14, and that's the water to blood. And then you get over to chapter 8 and the second plague, and that's the frogs come up everywhere. And then you get over to the third plague, and that's, uh, the, that's found in chapter 8, verse 16, and that's the gnats. Now, sometimes you might read, depending on your translation, lice or insects. And then the fourth plague, same chapter, that was of flies. And as you read of these, at first it was, for the most part, an inconvenience. But then the, the plagues progressed, they became more severe. And it ceased to be just an inconvenience, but really was destructive in nature. Destructive with regards to crops, destructive with regards to livestock, and destructive even with regards to the humans. For there was that occasion of the hell and those who were left out in the fields. They could be hurt and hurt severely by it. Then you read about the fifth plague. That's in chapter 9. And that's where the cattle die. As I mentioned, ceases to be just an inconvenience. It's destructive. Then the seventh plague was hail, once again. Destructive on any livestock left out and any humans left out. And there were some of both left out. Then you get to chapter 10, and that was the locust. And the locust, then that was destructive because it was eating up the vegetation, their crops, their fields. And then in chapter 9, there was the darkness. And then the tenth plague. And with the tenth plague, you've got far more said about this plague, and partially because of the preparation for the Israelites of this tenth plague. It was going to be death of the firstborn. And as previous to this, the Israelites had been exempt from these plagues. But now, yes, they can be exempt, but there's that offering of that lamb and the blood to be put on the doorpost and on the lintel. And so there's extensive instruction about this and about that meal that they are to eat together, that meal with unleavened bread. 
And then the tenth plague comes. And this tenth plague, death of the firstborn, wailing such as never had been throughout Egypt, as a child, well, not only children, but the firstborn of that household died, not just one in a city, not just one in a community, not just one on the street, but literally there's death in every household. We cannot imagine how that country was feeling, grieving, hurting as a result of this plague. And so finally, Pharaoh says, go! And the people of Egypt, it's about time they go! No more of this! And they leave. But oh, Pharaoh, he hardens his heart again. And he realizes we've lost our workforce. Go get them. And so the army goes after. And it speaks of the chosen chariots uh, among the other chariots and the horsemen and etc. In other words, it was the best the army had to offer. And here they go. But in the meantime... God, through Moses, parts the Red Sea, and the Israelites walk through as on dry ground. And so then, I'll just say this, those brave Egyptians try to do so. But God, while his people are now safe, he collapsed those waters on those Egyptians and all of these lives horses, chariots, and armaments lost. Now I know somebody might say, well, it sounded like uh, sounded like this was about Pharaoh and the Egyptians. Or it sounded like it was about Moses and the people of Israel being sent out of Egypt. Or it sounds like it was about the plagues. But I would suggest to you all of this it's been about God. It's been about God. And that brings us to then chapter 15. And I want, I, please, take your Bibles. Open to chapter 15. I'm going to basically be reading slowly through chapter 15. And if you're going to follow along, you're really going to need chapter 15 open. And what I want you to see is that, yes, it's about God. All of this, it's about God. Here we are reading in verse 15, the Moses and the people of Israel sang this song to the Lord, saying, and then verse 1, about halfway through it, most of the chapter is this song that was sung. So you got, got it open. Exodus chapter 15. It says in verse 1, middle part of that verse, I will sing to the Lord, for he has triumphed graciously. The horse and his rider he has thrown into the sea. The Lord is my strength and my song, and has become my salvation. This is my God. And I will praise him, my father's God, and I will exalt him. The Lord is a man of war. The Lord is his name. Pharaoh's chariots and his host, he cast into the sea. And his chosen officers were sunk in the Red Sea. The floods covered them. They went down into the depths like a stone. Your right hand, O Lord, glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, shatters the enemy. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes them like stubble. Are you seeing it? Are you seeing how many references in these few short verses are to Jesus, are to the Lord? 
and how he is magnified, how he is praised, how his strength and deliverance is acknowledged. All of what was from chapter 1 up to chapter 14 is leading to this very thing. And it's the Lord that saves. It's the Lord that delivers. It's the Lord who has that glorious power. Now verse 7. In the greatness of your majesty, you overthrow your adversaries. You send out your fury. It consumes like stubble. At the blast of your nostrils, the waters piled up. The floods stood up in a heap. The deeps congealed in the heart of the sea. The enemy said, I will pursue, I will overtake, I will divide the spoil. My desire shall have its fill of them. I will draw my sword, my hand shall destroy them. You blew away with your wind. The sea covered them. They sank like lead in the mighty waters. Who is like you, O Lord, among the gods? Who is like you, majestic in holiness? Awesome in glorious deeds, doing wonders. You stretched out your right hand. The earth swallowed them. You have led in your steadfast love the people whom you have redeemed. And you have guided them by your strength to your holy abode. The peoples have heard. They tremble. Pangs have seized the inhabitants of Philistia. Now are the chiefs of Edom dismayed. Trembling seizes the leaders of Moab. All the inhabitants of Canaan have melted away. Terror and dread fall upon them. Because of the greatness of your arm, they are still as a stone. Till your people, O Lord, pass by, till the people pass by whom you have purchased, you will bring them in and plant them on your own mountain. The place, O Lord, which you have made for your abode. The sanctuary, O Lord, which your hands have established. The Lord will reign forever and ever. You know, this is nothing short of one of the most beautiful glorifications of God you will find in any place, in any book, written by anyone. And though he references Egypt and its armies and the Red Sea, and even though he references some of the coming enemies of Israel, this is a song glorifying God. I hope that when you find yourself in the struggle where, oh, I know you're not an Israelite and you're not in Egypt and you're not a slave in Egypt and you don't have taskmasters and being dreadfully treated. But I hope when you find yourself at a point in life where it's a struggle and it's hard and you're wondering where is the relief coming that you can remember this story. And you can remember this story of ultimate triumph. And you can remember the story of how God is to be praised. Because that's what this song is about. God is to be praised. This afternoon, if there is a need you have as far as obedience we can assist with if there's a need for prayer we offer you this as an occasion to make that known you may come as we stand